presentation. Okay, will be this two 15 minute presentations by our um, and a, a warm welcome to our speakers, Darren Renko and Clint Carroll. Thank you so much for for accepting to be here and to share your knowledge with us. So the 15 minute presentations will be followed by a wider discussion and a Q&A in the remaining 40 minutes. Before I introduce our moderator, there are just a few housekeeping points I would like to make. So if you could please um, keep your microphones turned off during the presentations. Um, the presentation will be recorded. So uh, keep that in mind. And, and if you are uncomfortable, then keep your cameras uh, off or on as you prefer. Um, by remaining in the room as we record the meeting, you consent to being recorded. The recording will be available on the CRASH website um, and on the Indigenous Studies Discussion Group Cambridge YouTube channel after the event. Uh, we will only record the presentation, um, not the discussion afterwards, okay? Um, captioning has been enabled for this event. If you'd like to have captioning, you can select it at the bottom of your screen. Please note the captions are provided by Zoom. <laughs> And Crash, or neither Crash nor us, <laughs> cannot be held responsible for the accuracy. And finally, um, we would like to provide an inclusive and safe environment in this online event. Um, it, it goes, of course, without saying, uh, we hope all attendees show respect and courtesy to the speakers and to each other throughout the event. And without further delay, I would like to welcome our moderator today, who then will take the lead on the conversation. So Tami Okamoto, thank you so much. Uh, Tami Okamoto is a PhD candidate at the University of Cambridge in the Department of Geography and a National Geographic Explorer, or Gen Geographic, sorry, <laughs> Explorer. Her research interests include territory, critical indigenous geographies, and spatial epistemologies, praxis and embodiment in Amazonia. For over 10 years, she has collaborated with Amazonian indigenous organizations and autonomous governments in Peru at the interface of academia, policy-related work, and on-ground territorial struggles. Her PhD research project builds upon this ongoing engagement. It seeks to recenter indigenous geographies as a way to unpack the crisis of post-colonial territory in Amazonia. Tami, thank you so much for accepting, and the floor is yours. Thanks for that, Mariana. So welcome, everyone. I'm delighted to be moderating this panel. Um, so as Mariana said, um, the session will last an hour and a half, and we hope to have around 15 minutes of presentation of each um, speaker, and then some, um, some sort of a more open discussion among them, and to finalize the session, um, some, some questions from the audience around the general themes of this panel, but also people are welcome to bring in the research and the implications of that in, in our thinking. So to our esteemed panelists, first, I'd like to introduce Dr. Clint Carroll. Clint Carroll is an Associate Professor of Native American and Indigenous Studies in the Department of Ethnic Studies at the University of Colorado Boulder. He's a citizen of the Cherokee Nation. His longstanding work with the Cherokee people in Oklahoma aims to advance methods and strategies for indigenous land education and community-based conservation. He writes and thinks at the intersections of critical indigenous studies, anthropology, and political ecology. Dr. Carroll currently co-edits the Cambridge Indigenous Studies, um, sorry, the, the, the Cambridge University Press series, Elements in Indigenous Environmental Research. And he also serves on the editorial boards of, for cultural anthropology and environment and society. We then move on to Dr. Darren Renko. Uh, Darren is a citizen of the Penobscot Nation. He's an associate professor of anthropology, chair of Native American programs at the University of Maine, and is faculty in the George J. Mitchell Center for Sustainability Solutions. His research focuses on the ways in which indigenous nations in North America resist environmental destruction by using indigenous science, 
diplomacies and critiques of liberalism to protect natural and cultural resources. He was published in a range of topics related to indigenous lands and environments, including environmental risk and justice, climate change, invasive species, research ethics, and indigenous subsistence issues. A very warm welcome to both of you and thank you for coming um, today. Um, so before I ask each of the panelists to present, I thought I'd just briefly and broadly look at some of the concepts that bring us together today. Uh, personally, I think the concepts in the title of this panel on well-being and the environment, traditional knowledge and conservation have the potential to contribute to a range of debates across disciplines and praxis. Uh, definitely, what I think is that one issue that brings us together to discuss the subtleties of indigenous centered conservation and well being, I would say, has to do with this questioning of a, a common claim that conservation projects can convert local, local people into long term environmental stewards and improve their well being. Evidence, however, frequently contradicts these win win claims. Among the most prevalent conservation strategies worldwide are protected areas, community-based regimes, and market-based approaches. Among the benefits at the local and the global scales uh, promised by projects, combining one or more of these strategies are biodiversity conservation, watershed maintenance, the reduction of poverty, the preservation of cultural values, meeting global food demands, mitigating climate change, just to give a few examples. Literature in the last two decades had, has noted how the proliferation of these initiatives has outspaced a critical examination of their impacts. Concerns tends to stress the limits uh, or the limited understanding of how these initiatives shape local conservation and human well being outcomes. At the margins of these debates, however, um, that are interested in how conservation strategies shape landscapes and well being, however, uh, seem to be questions on how indigenous peoples and conservation from indigenous frameworks rather conceive and shape from within the conservation and well being debate and praxis. Uh, this approach to conservation and the environment draws our attention to re relativi the relativity of well being. Um, and also to the complex spatiotemporal relationality and the, the articulation of epistemologies and praxis that underlie uh, contemporary conservation approaches in spaces considered, particularly in spaces considered ancestral lands or territories or reappropriated as such by indigenous peoples. So I think um, the work of our panelists today speak to some of these issues and I think uh, can help us to continue those conversations which um, are incredibly fruitful um, for our world. So to start off, um, we have um, Dr. Clint Carroll, who will speak about Indigenous-led conservation as acceptation, engagements, and strategies in the Cherokee country. Please, Clint. Hello, Tammy. Um, thank you. Osio Nigatawu, Ukahati Sikwani Liga. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for being here. Thank you to all the organizers, Mariana and the Indigenous Studies Discussion Group for, for having me here. I'm grateful to be here. I'm speaking to you from the territories of the Ute, Cheyenne, and Arapaho nations, um, uh, more commonly uh, today known as Longmont, Colorado. I teach at the University of Colorado at Boulder. Um, and I, I want to present kind of a smattering of, of different, as I said in, in the title, strategies and engagements um, coming from my work with my Cherokee community, um, uh, which is based in Oklahoma, but you know we're working outside of our reservation boundaries and thinking about conservation more broadly, um, as well as internally and kind of having these discussions um, as a nation and, and, and thinking through what conservation means on a, uh, tribal level on an indigenous level um, to um, allude to what some of Tammy was saying earlier. Um, and so this all really kind of comes out of my longstanding work with uh, Cherokee elders and knowledge keepers in Oklahoma um, and really has a lot to do with 
how we address questions of environmental governance as an indigenous nation. And um, you know, these conversations have spanned uh, from uh, representation uh, within our own tribal government and uh, the, the systems and structures that we operate within that um, um, you know, as, as manifested in their current form are not entirely of our making. Um, and so there is a certain amount of imposition uh, in how we approach the process and, and the project of environmental governance, including conservation. Um, but I use the term exaptation in my title um, to imply and to really kind of uh, signal my approach to thinking through these kind of structural issues and issues of process and governance um, and highlighting how Cherokee people are working within our own institutions, as well as within foreign institutions like the National Park Service, the US National Park Service, um, to really think through strategically and to engage in ways that accomplish the goals that are really the foundation of how we um, um, think of ourselves in relation to the land. Uh, and that is compounded by numerous um, uh, layers, historical, political, social, cultural, um, most notably in terms of uh, where we are today as Cherokee people. The Cherokee Nation is not, um, uh, does not inhabit our traditional homelands in the southeastern uh, part of North America, or, or what is now called the United States. And so we think about relationality with land as being um, something that has been uprooted, but nevertheless continues in light of dispossession. Um, and so that adds a layer to how I think about and, and, and how we're talking about conservation as Cherokee people in Oklahoma today. And so with that um, brief preface, I'll go ahead and share some slides and uh, we'll um, uh, kind of work off of those. And this is all in the interest, as I said, of, of just kind of opening up discussion. I don't have a formal paper to read to you all, um, but um, hopefully, um, you know, in dialogue, we can kind of unpack some of the material I'll be presenting. Uh, give me a second real quick. There we go. Okay, um, Mariana, can you give me a thumbs up if you see what I'm sharing here? We can see it, yes, okay. perfect. All right, and so this image here, just to open up, and I will get into the more of the details uh, later in the presentation, but this is an image uh, taken from field work in Buffalo National River uh, with our Cherokee medicine keepers. They're a group of fluent uh, speaking uh, Cherokee elders and uh, knowledge keepers um, who uh, lent their expertise and knowledge to enact really a landmark agreement between the Cherokee Nation and the National Park Service uh, regarding gathering plants within uh, Buffalo National River. And so this is an image here of Gary Van uh, with the gray and green cap uh, speaking with the, uh, a, a researcher, uh, undergraduate researcher from the University of Arizona who worked with us on this project. Um, as you can see, a, a, a tour of uh, young folks uh, walking behind a national park uh, ranger uh, kind of encapsulates the nature of this work. But this was a, an ethnobotanical study that, that uh, really was a foundational component of establishing this agreement, uh, which uh, uh, excitingly was, uh, officially signed, made official and, and, and the chief, our principal chief signed the document uh, just a couple weeks ago. So this is a, a photo from 2017, but the issue is very much recent. So I wanted to uh, set things up uh, by talking about how Cherokee people approach uh, relationality with land and really kind of the foundations of our work in conservation broadly today. And these are two phrases that are offered uh, that were offered to me by uh, my elder John Ross, uh, who is also a, a member of the Cherokee Nation Medicine Keepers. And uh, the first one, Nigada Gusti Dida is the Cherokee way of talking about relationality. And uh, it translates to we are all related, but the we and the all are expansive in, in terms of not just humans. Uh, but encompassing the more than human world, the land, the waterways, 
Um, this is a, a pretty common throughout indigenous languages. Uh, we, I hear more prominently the um, um, Lakota, Dakota, Nakota way of, of, of discussing this um, uh, mitaku yasin, but this is the Cherokee way of expressing this relationality with uh, the land and all life. And the second one, nigada de dadani lagi, so respect all things. And really things is kind of a, uh, a gloss for what this means. It, 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 it encompasses all life. So respect all life, respect everything. And so these are the ways that Cherokee people embark on this act of conservation, uh, of, of, of you know, strategically engaging with this notion of conservation um, from a Cherokee perspective. So I'll offer a couple other quotes that to me speak to the same concept. Uh, Crosland Smith, Cherokee medicine keeper and spiritual leader of the Cherokee nation has said, we have to do something to honor the spirit of this land. And this was said in the context of, as I mentioned previously, being a dispossessed people, not being of the land that we now reside in, 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 in Northeastern Oklahoma, um, but this being a land that we've developed relationships to over generations nonetheless. And so this contemporary uh, uh, quote here from Crosland Smith is really in, in, in embodying the sense of responsibility and of relationality to land that may not be the homelands, but are nevertheless a homeland. As well as this quote by Gary Van, he says, we were always told you come from the land and everything you need comes from the land. It's your fault if you go hungry. And this may seem um, kind of a harsh way of expressing relationality with the land, but that's the foundational uh, underpinning here is, is thinking about when he was growing up and knowing that from the teachings he received from his parents and grandparents and from his community, um, the land was there to take care of you. And so if you don't um, enact that relationality through the knowledge and the practices that you've inherited from your community, um, then that's kind of you know his way of saying it's your own fault. Um, so this is something that we take as a given, this, this relationship to land. And so as a conceptual framework, the way that I'm thinking about um, you know, employing these frameworks, these relational frameworks uh, in, in how we think about indigenous engagement with conservation and the implications for health broadly construed. So community health, uh, ecological health, uh, I'm using this word exaptation in a subversive way. You know, it's it's a it's a term that it it's coming from evolutionary biology and and uh, the history of technology, and it describes a trait or a tool that has been co-opted for a use that differs from its original purpose. And so, sitting with that for a while as we think about native engagements, indigenous engagements with conservation, whether that be through uh, as I said, foreign institutions like our National Park Service in the United States, or whether it's articulating conservation from an indigenous kind of nationalist framework, if you will, using uh, more uh, of a concept of territorial sovereignty to um, create conservation within existing uh, reservation boundaries. Um, these are all co-optations of conservation in the sense that native people aren't taking for granted necessarily the formation of, of conservation enclosures as they originally came to be. Um, and I'll go into that in a little bit more detail uh, soon. But I'm also thinking about this along the same, same lines as a, as a strategic engagement with foreign systems and structures and mechanisms. Uh, in order to regain access to land through myriad legal and political approaches. And then lastly, we go back to the quote that I presented earlier from uh, Crosland Smith, thinking about these acts and these practices of conservation as a form of relational continuity or the persistence of ethically and culturally grounded relationships with the land and non-humans, despite social and spatial change. And so indigenous-led conservation disrupts this human nature duality of that we see in dominant models of conservation, 
by accounting for relationality with the land as I've described um, previously. But also thinking about strategic engagements or the use of legal mechanisms. I'm drawing from Beth Rose Middleton's work, uh, cultural conservation easements and the establishment of native land trusts as ways that indigenous nations and communities can use dominant legal tools to again, you know, going up a bullet point there to uh, ensure access to land that, that really subverts or um, uses these tools in ways to accomplish indigenous goals through indigenous frameworks, um, but nonetheless, um, you know, through the vehicle of dominant legal mechanisms like conservation easements. And then uh, lastly here, enacting or reviving sustainable indigenous practices on the land uh, can enhance local ecosystem health. And I'll get to this in a minute, but also broadly construed uh, notions of community health. And so through these acts, we see indigenous in uh, indigenous led conservation restoring connections to the land and by doing so resulting in spiritual and psychological healing for native communities and this is again taking a page from beth rose middleton's uh really important work uh i've got an image of her book here in a second to, to plug that uh really incredible um uh, piece of scholarship uh, but also restoring indigenous access to the land in the context of settler colonialism and dispossession contributes to how we might think of environmental justice for native communities when put in that framework of settler ongoing and, and um, structural uh, uh, expressions of settler colonialism uh, indigenous conservation is really an act of environmental justice and so this is uh, beth rose middleton's book that i mentioned previously and so from this point on, I'm gonna go through and describe a couple of projects, a couple of um, you know, recent um, uh, news items that relate to the work that we've been doing. Um, and then uh, I will try to keep an eye on the time here and, and make sure that we have plenty of time uh, for discussion and for, um, for Darren's um, presentation. But this was taken a couple of weeks ago and it's a, an image of our medicine keepers uh, representatives from the National Park Service and uh, tribal elected officials, including our principal chief in the blue uh, tie there, Chuck Hoskin Jr., announcing and, and formally signing uh, an agreement with Buffalo National River, as I mentioned previously, but also announcing in tandem our the, the establishment of the Medicine Keepers Preserve in Adair County uh, in, in the Cherokee Reservation in Northeastern Oklahoma. And this is really um, a product of years and years of work. <clears throat> and as I mentioned, um, working in tandem with, in collaboration with uh, Cherokee elders or medicine keepers um, to, to have those discussions around not only internal issues of governance, of environmental governance as they pertain to land conservation and the influence of uh, traditional knowledge uh, Cherokee knowledge that is uh, coming from a position of um, elder knowledge keepers who have been raised with land-based knowledge, um, uh, uh, and, and that includes uh, medic medicinal knowledge, uh, how to identify um, uh, foods, wild foods, as well as uh, materials for various uh, crafts, um, and, and really kind of encompassing that relationship with the land that is not necessarily taken for granted among all Cherokee people. And that is uh, having to do with two main issues here. One, assimilation and the attempted uh, eradication of indigenous cultures by the U.S. colonial government. Um, and that's through boarding schools as well as through um, the second one, uh, Lose the, the theft of land uh, that we've experienced uh, significantly, not only due to dispossession from our homelands, um, but after uh, the arrival in what is now Northeastern Oklahoma, the allotment policy in which we lost 98% of lands that once used to be Cherokee owned. And so these acts are hugely significant, both, significant, both in terms of the cultural loss that we've sustained, um, but 
have been resilient throughout and have been able to maintain um, through the work of the medicine keepers, but also through the, the, the theft of land that has really constrained our ability to actively relate to places and actively go and harvest and interact and, and, um, um, and, and be in relationship with the land itself. And so we see the medicine keepers preserve, you'll see it on the, the, to the right of the screen here, kind of a detail, uh, fuzzy in, in, in our view, but a, de a, a map of where this preserve is. Um, I don't have an image for you today, but to look at uh, the tribal trust land holdings uh, that the Cherokee Nation has today uh, in comparison to the 4.42 um, uh, million acres of lands that we once used to own in Fee Simple uh, communally uh, by the people, it really is a dismal picture. And so the act of preserving a tract of land within that uh, is really significant when you think of it in light of all of the above. This is an image of uh, a, a portion of that preserve. And in fact, you know, this English name, the Medicine Keepers Preserve does not really get at the full meaning that the Medicine Keepers have, have given this place. Um, it's an, a, a beautiful, uh, almost a thousand acres uh, tract of land in Eastern Adair County. Uh, and they refer to it in the language as Nawatohiada Nawotii, or the peaceful place of medicine. And so therein uh, uh, encompassing a sense of connection that, that exceeds conservation, it exceeds preservation. It's more about uh, enacting uh, and, and voicing a relationality with land um, that implies its, um, its value in terms of healing and in terms of peace and in terms of connection. And so with that, I know I am running short on time. Um, I'm, I'm almost at my 15 minute mark. Um, I wanna show a clip here of uh, just coming from the words of John Ross himself that really speaks to the perspective that we've encountered and we've uh, been working to kind of um, project among all Cherokees and beyond uh, of what it means to conserve land from a Cherokee perspective. And again, John Ross is a fluent Cherokee speaker. He's, a, he's one of our medicine keepers. And in this clip, he talks about um, the connection between land and health. And, and I'll just give a brief setup to the video first. This is a photo voice video. And so what we did back in 2015 uh, was we convened the medicine keepers. We talked about uh, what a photo voice project is, which simply speaking, it's um, you, you have a group, a community, a, a group of people um, who go out and take pictures on their own uh, about these themes related to uh, the themes that the project defines. And it's a, it's a community defined project. And so the themes of this project were land and health. And so th these are in John Ross's words and through the images that he took, uh, what land and health, a brief clip of what land and health mean to him. And well, hopefully this works. And every plant was important to churches. You know, we don't know half of as much as our ancestors did. But, you know, they didn't have hospitals and that's, that's what they, they used these plants to keep healthy. And we need to learn from that. You know, if we eat more wild foods, and if you we use the medicines that, that our people used, uh, you know, it will be in a healthier state. And the only way we can preserve it is, uh, you know, we we got to protect it. And there's few areas that uh, you can find all these medicine, medicinal plants. But, you know, there's a lot of farmers and ranchers, you know, they'll just cut all everything out to raise cattle and the Cherokees didn't like that when I was growing up. That's where Cherokees used to hunt and now they can't go in there. That's where they used to gather, you know, even to go look for wild onions. And that's what was important to, to our people. It still is. You, know, you can't go in those places anymore. You know, we need to preserve our area somewhere. We're losing a lot of our culture, even our language, and the language that goes along with our culture. You know, we've got names of the, all these trees and plants and our environment that we have, and if we don't protect that, we're going to 
lose it all. I've been advocating for a number of years, and it's a uh, to have our own national park. We can call it Chucky National Park, but we need large acreage just for our environment to go back to a natural state. And it it takes a lot of work, but uh, I think it would be beneficial to really start thinking about something like that. Set aside, you know, ten thousand acres. If we had that much acreage, we wouldn't have to worry about uh, you know losing it. Somebody bulldozing the trees and plants and everything away and putting you know putting cattle in there, destroying the environment. You know, we could protect that for our future generation. You know, it's never too late to do that. Okay. Oops. Let's see if I can get back on track here. Um, <clears throat> so I'm going to have to wrap up and I'm leaving a lot out. So hopefully this will come out in the Q and A and discussion. Um, but what I wanted to close with was, you know, thinking about, again, going back to the conceptual frameworks, going back to thinking through Cherokee ethical and relational frameworks of what this work entails amid the structural and ongoing conditions of settler colonialism. You, you heard John Ross talk about um, what we're constrained by, and he mentioned a figure of 10,000 acres, and um, you know that is an aspirational goal because the reality is uh, we're, we're working with much limited areas and that have been checkerboarded, and so we have, we don't really have the ability to contiguously draw a line around 10,000 acres, um, but we can do so in, in, in piecemeal fashion that in fact is actually an expression of uh, more localized forms of conservation and can be seen as a more strategic way of, of protecting um, certain areas that communities therefore have ownership to in the local, um, in the local context or have uh, ownership or stewardship of. And so um, that kind of segues into more recent work that we're uh, doing together through a, um, a grant from the National Science Foundation to really understand these questions of access and um, have uh, really Cherokee understandings and experiences navigating such a fractionated landscape inform a tribal or a comprehensive tribal conservation plan uh, that again uh, may not be in terms of the um, the ideal scenario, uh, but engages strategically with what we're dealing with and what we have to work with now. Um, and that, of course, leading to uh, both um, psychological health and physical health in terms of just maintaining our connection to the land as Cherokee people um, and, and, and seeing the implications from that uh, unfold uh, within our communities. So I'll end there. Thank you very much, Wadon, and I look forward to hearing uh, from Darren. Thank you so much, Clint. That was absolutely fascinating. Um, so our next speaker is um, Dr. Darren Renko. So Darren is going to speak to um, centering Wabanaki peoples and nations in land protection and conservation. The floor is yours, Darren. Thank you so much. So pleased to be joining you all uh, this afternoon, evening there. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm Darren Ranko and I'm, I'm actually um, Zooming you from my own <laughs> tribal homelands in a place called now called Dedham, Maine, but we call uh, Neheme Benage uh, or Turkey Hill. Um, so there's a lot of turkeys that run around my hill here in the hills <laughs> uh, uh, country near in, in my homelands. Um, and uh, you know, I want to I, I want to share with you. And I, I guess you know, before I start, I just say you know, Clint's work is really uh, guiding in this, and 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 in some ways. The, um, He's been doing the, the engagements with conservation uh, longer than I have. This is my newest um, frame of research. Um, please please check out Clint's book, Roots, Roots of Our Renewal. It's, it's an amazing accomplishment and book. And he mentioned Beth Rose Middleton's work, um, uh, Trust in the Land is also 
uh, quite uh, important and extraordinary for, for this uh, piece. So let me share my screen here. Um, so hopefully that, that looks right. Um, yeah, so I, again, you know, this is new, newish work for me. Um, uh, but I do have some goals. I want to talk about some of the opportunities um, that we're seeing in my homeland um, around indigenous led conservation, um, which is cut up in sort of the political movements related to uh, land back and rematriation. Um, but also it's, you know, responding to specifically Wabanaki um, engagements and responsibility to place. Um, I want to. I'm going to hint at. I, I underlined and bolded this, but I, I do want to talk about some of the the pieces of evidence related to indigenous centered conservation work. Um, as much as what I say and, and engage with land conservation groups, um, but sort of where that puts us uh, in in relation to this work, and then identify best practices for establishing indigenous led conservation work, and because this is. Um, the work I'm I'm engaging in is is definitely to um, think about um, how the collaborations can happen um, at, uh, with indigenous leadership. Um, so this is just a map of the state of Maine, uh, what is now the state of Maine, um, and these are all the protected lands from for conservation even public uh, lands, uh, concert, you know, basically lands that have some level of conservation and protection, either um, as federal, uh, state, or, or land conservation. The light green is the land conservation, and the dark green is the sort of state and federal um, um, piece of this. Uh, this is re represents roughly 23% of the state of Maine. And as Wabanaki people, this is also, for, for us, what we're seeing as part of uh, an opportunity. Um, in case you you don't know where our tribes are, I always have to say that, you know, this is who, um, where the four, four tribal nations and five reservations are located in what is now Maine. Um, but also, uh, our lands, um, um, we do have uh, under our control um, over 300,000 acres of land as Wabanaki people in the state of Maine, um, the majority of which were part of a land claim uh, in, that was settled in 1980, um, which also that legislation came with some really disastrous poison pills as it relates to our sovereignty. But we do have this, this work um, across the tribes, um, these lands that uh, we either have in trust or in fee um, that we manage uh, directly. Uh, another key part of this work um, and what gets mobilized really more importantly is that our, our territory as Wabanaki people is not bound by the state of Maine or the United States. It, it stretches into what is now Canada, um, and, I, and it's uh, when, when we enact um, uh, our, our collective work as Wabanaki nations, um, which is a confederacy and, and a cultural grouping, um, we enact it in all of our homelands. And I, and I think that's critical to this work. Uh, for us, we, we really want to, um, when we think about responsibility to place, it is, this is our place. And, um, um, luckily, this is we have not been moved out of our place, although we have been <laughs> uh, managed and, and, and lands have been taken from us in, in dramatic ways uh, as other indigenous people. So I think this, this is a critical um, frame for, for me and how to think about this work. Um, I'm sure many of you are aware of various uh, indigenous uh, led um, movements for land return and rematriation. I do want to just get a little bit on the definitions of that. Because I think um, sometimes folks are a little loose in the, the definitions. The For me, um, each of these movements, uh, uh, the political uh, and cultural interventions the, that are um, anti-colonial, they each um, reference and center right relationships between humans and non-humans. Um, land back is a much more um, 
explicit political movement in terms of it being um, a call to return everything stolen from us as indigenous peoples, land, language, ceremony, medicines, kinship, that sort of thing. Rematriation work um, is uh, much more engaging in a cultural movement. Um, it, it explicitly um, centers women and tradition, uh, not sort of colonial men types of leadership and, and, and property systems, but um, really is about re returning um, our our relations and um, maintaining them. And I, it, it strikes me, I, I, I've seen, you know, uh, I sometimes quote a tweet I saw from a young indigenous um, activist uh, who said, the land wants us uh, back as well. Um, and, and I think that that notion of the agency and, and the responsibility that, that rematriation is about um, um, is a critical part of this. And, and, and in my mind, you know, each is maybe um, perhaps incomplete or doesn't fully capture kind of the, the moment. And, and I think um, thinking about each, each kind of frame is important. Um, it'd be silly for me as a Wabanaki man without uh, referencing rematriation, without referencing um, Sherry Mitchell, who's an author and thinker, Delta Penobscot, and sort of thinking about um, why this is important work in terms of our responsibilities and the role of Wabanaki women. Um, she talks about Wabanaki women being uh, once again at the center of our communities, leading the work to recover our traditional ways of knowing and being through language, renewal of kinship networks, revitalization of land-based teachings that focus on the relationships that exist between all systems within creation. The women are also decolonizing our stories, developing pathways for food sovereignty and protecting our lands and waters. And um, her organization, the Land Peace Foundation of, uh, upon which I'm, the, uh, I'm on the board of, um, uh, has, has a project related to this, which I don't have time to go into today, but I, it's, it's a really extraordinary example of what I think is rematriation work. Um, in the context of scholarship and why this is important um, in what we're facing as possible engagements and possible dilemmas and, and um, um, political arguments for and against is, and this, is, this, is, this World Bank report um, is quoted uh, publicly and privately um, a lot. Um, sometimes it's not even referenced. It just, there's a, you know, sort of like, you know, a factual kind of frame to it in terms of the, the political movements. But it, I, I do think it, it's, it's um, when people talk about indigenous people having, um, co you know, coinciding and in, in, in living on the areas that hold 80% of the planet's biodiversity, um, this is this report has been challenged in, in interesting ways. I think you know there are ways to do it um, conceptually. There are ways to do it percentage-wise, but I think it, it shifted the discussion and it's shifted um, scholarship, which I think has gotten more nuanced and more finely attuned um, in a variety of ways. Um, I, I have I, I don't have time to go into all of that um, scholarship. I will say that I, I was a party to one of the pieces of that scholarship and just one one frame of it that looks at, um, um, it uses some, some really um, new uh, tools to look at the, the impact of human, human management uh, and human influence on, on, on ter terrestrial nature over the last 12,000 years. Um, and I think for us, when we look at, you know, how humans have shaped environments in the last 12,000 years, it actually hasn't it's, it's been, you know, depending on how you want to frame it, humans have not been universally or always a problem. Uh, in fact, humans have um, shaped and managed terrestrial nature in, in, in a lot of positive ways for, for a lot of the 12,000 years, uh, last couple hundred, not, not, not as good. Um, and, you know, in this piece, we talk about how the current biodiversity losses are caused uh, not by human conversion or degradation of untouched ecosystems, right? This idea that it's humans versus untouched ecosystems. But in fact, 
uh, the, the losses have been caused by appropriation, colonization, and intensification of use in lands inhabited and used by prior societies, i.e. Um, largely indigenous peoples. So that frame of, you know, is also a hopeful frame. Humans aren't necessarily the problem, although our current <laughs> systems of extractive colonialism and capitalism are, are not helping clearly. So it's into those spaces the, of scholarship and the, the politics and movements uh, that we as Wabanaki people have started to more, more directly engage with um, land trust and conservation um, uh, groups in, in our region. Um, and uh, it, it led to the, the eventual, and I'll talk more about the, the creation of a, um, a a commission with uh, representation from all our tribes related to this work. Um, it started first though with um, some of us meeting, some of us who are educators and sort of uh, other kinds of, uh, sort of other kinds of leadership roles, uh, meeting with the land trust community in, in the state of Maine. Um, and they, in response to some of these meetings, the, they formed what was called the what was called the first light learning journey, um, and that really was about conservation land trust organizations and the Wab and Wabanaki tribes um, thinking about how to rebuild Wabanaki stewardship and presence across the landscape, and we were inspired by. Beth Rose and her book and, and, and a lot of the work that um, Cherokee is doing with, and that Clinton's talked about, um, looking out that this is actually a possible thing. And of course, it's about restoring our prosperity, expanding our stewardship uh, through collaborations and acquiring lands through um, and, and thinking about this in terms of land back and, and rematriation um, as well. So, that learning journey was um, started out first as a as a as an opportunity for people in the land trust community to learn more about um, and because they didn't they don't they didn't know who we are <laughs> and, uh, and for us to learn a little bit more about them, um, but also to kind of um, it was a kind of learning journey and a series of commitments um, by land trusts um, in the state to kind of formulate and reformulate their commitment. Uh, towards indigenous peoples. In response to this um, work, I was I helped uh, organize. Um, these are all the commission. The Wabanaki Commission on Land Stewardship is made up of um, two representatives from each of our tribal nation uh, governments here in the state. Uh, was the state of Maine, um, and so it it serves in this function around our diplomacy. It, it it accesses a lot of the protocols and traditions of working together across our landscape. So, luckily, that that helps us work together um, and then engage as we used it <laughs> during the during the um, the more directly. Uh, colonial, European colonial period, um, ways of, of focusing our energies and, and working together. Um, it's obviously the, the, the mission, again, the, it, was, it was only seeded in January of 2021. So we're just a little over the, a year into this work. Um, um, so I'm gonna, you know, the mission is, is clear, reflects this engagement, improve the health and well-being of uh, Wabanaki people through sustained effort to expand our access management and ownership of lands to practice our land-based cultures. Um, and the mission is supported by acquiring lands, sharing and co-managing land that is currently owned by land trusts and conservation organizations. And we do this through partnership and education um, that reflects our our knowledge systems, expertise, and perspective. Um, even though this is early on, we've 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 had um, over fifteen hundred acres of land returned. There's there's thousands of acres um, that are in negotiation or under um, some part of a process to be returned. And then we've also created sort of access agreements. And I know that this is um, work that that Clint has been engaged in with uh, the, with parks and and different things. Um, and, and that's part of the work here, but also with land trusts, um, sort of permits for gathering, these sorts of things. And so thousands of acres have been opened up uh, in that way. And we're working on the possibilities for um, um, things like cultural use agreements, which are tools which 
um, create more permanent uh, access points uh, across uh, land trusts, uh, lands, and, and conservation easements. Um, as one of the people organizing and trying to bring this into, into being, um, it takes a lot of time, uh, staff, it, it, it needs to be community driven, it, it, um, how uh, the commission itself thinks about its work as a clearinghouse for all the tribal nations, and how we um, maintain our role, um, reflecting our, our diplomacy traditions is really, really important. I sometimes share this, you know, with with land trusts and conservation groups uh, in particular. That there are, um, you know, this isn't the new work. Um, most of you probably know that uh, there are. This is just from some work done in in um, what is now Australia, known as Australia. Some conservation best practices that that land trusts and conservation groups can um, can do. So, you know, this this form of engagement and the politics of it, you know, in terms of, oh, we don't know, there isn't a way to do it. This is, we're, we're, we're into this pretty deep. And, you know, this is work that's being mobilized and implicated in a lot of different policy regimes related to both biodiversity, but also just land protection. There are these movements for, um, you know, protecting lands, 50% 50, uh, 50 of lands by 2050, or in the U.S., there's this 20, 30, you know, goal of 30% of lands and sort of the role of indigenous people in this are, is going to be quite critical um, as we think about, um, because the best, you know, the, the scholarship, I guess, in terms of before I go to my last slide, the scholarship basically says um, indigenous peoples, when they're, when, when indigenous peoples are leaders or in partners in conservation work, um, those are those are the the best and most effective um, forms of land protection. Um, when when it's just uh, conservation groups um, uh, without indigenous uh, leadership, it's um, it's not uh, as effective. It, it tends not to be as expansive in, in that work. Um, so I'd say, you know, in conclusion, reflecting on this work, it's it's. Uh, you know, it's a new project for me. So it's one of these heart pieces of, of work for, for land return. The fact that I'm in my territory and we're trying to do this work holds a lot of hope um, in, in doing these engagements. Um, I'm not so surprised um, and nor should anyone else that there are ongoing legacies around the colonial structures of property regimes that um, have impacted us and extracted so much of our lands um, from our control. And one of them that, that is really interesting and, and people have talked about too is that, and, and, and Beth Rose in her book and, and others, that conservation easements are often tied to uh, these, the, the easements, the protective, the legal protections are tied to um, uh, colonial structures, right? Um, sort of how can, in asking the question, how can indigenous leadership work in these situations? Oftentimes the easements require, you know, evidence that we're, you know, that humans are not harming things. And then what kind of evidence does that look like? Um, and, and how does it need to be monitored? Um, these are all really um, tricky questions. And, and they, they, as we get into the details of them, they can be, um, um, almost uh, traumatic because it's sort of like, oh, well, we'll just have one of our land managers observe you <laughs> as you're gathering. And that was just like an absolute no-go. So it's those kinds of situations that need to be addressed that are kind of uh, their own form of legacies. Um, and then sort of land back, rematriation are interconnected and need each other. Um, and really, I, you know, one of the things that we, we try to do is ask, um, land, uh, land um, uh, trusts and land conservation groups and sort of what kinds of opportunities and barriers are there in advancing these kinds of relationship and doing this work. So thank you so much. I'll end there. I'm, I'm slightly over time. And uh, yeah, it's really great and uh, being here. Thanks so much, Darren. Um, those, those were also some great um, pictures that I just want to make the, the account a lot more vivid. So thank you so much. 
Um, so I thought I would just um, open the floor now um, to some discussion among, among um, our panelists. And I'd like to start, um, start off by allowing you yourselves to comment on each other's, each other's presentations as well and each other's um, experiences. Um, Clint, I don't know if we could um, start with you uh, just to follow the same order. Sure. Um, yeah. Thank you, Darren. And it's really awesome to hear about this work. And, um, you know, I, I have a lot of questions. I guess my, my big question um, has to do with um, strategy um, and, and how, so a couple, on a couple of different notes, like one, um, you know, the engagement with these existing conservation zones, if you will, or established conservation lands uh, through that mechanism of land trust or, or through the mechanism of, of conservation easements and how that may or may not relate to um, kind of a comprehensive understanding of, of climate change in the midst of it. So, and I'll, I'll back up a little bit and explain why this, um, why I'm thinking about this, because I think conservation as we know it, um, you know, thinking back to what we both have said about this kind of dominant system or structure of, um, you know, placing a boundary around a certain tract of land, um, you know, and, and, and how that is kind of the roots of that are in you know, colonialism, but also you know, enclosures that go all the way back to like um, England and the, I don't know, 15th, 16th century, something like that, um, as, a, as, a, as a mechanism for, um, uh, well, doing exactly that, enclosing a, a tract of land. And then uh, you know, in their origins, they were for elites to hunt within them. And so then you've got the criminalization of people who go in and gather wood or, or whatnot, um, usually you know, peasant or local people. So given that framework of enclosure, and then when we pair that or we put that in the context of, of climate shift and climate change, they don't match up there. Um, and so I wonder if that's an element to your work is, you know, yeah, we're dealing with these like, you know, fixed boundaries, but we know that, you know, the, the natural world and, 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 you know, ecological processes and animals and, and, and then we've got the compounded effects of climate change and, and the shift therein um, don't obey these kind of political borders, right? Or these um, um, socially constructed boundaries. So I wonder like to what extent is that also a part of, of the work y'all are doing uh, and thinking strategically about, um, you know, the underlying foundation of, 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 of rematriation and, and land back and reconnecting to, to lands and, and, and that kind of thing. Yeah, Clint, thanks so much. And, you know, again, you're, <laughs> you're, you know, we have so many <laughs> projects and <clears throat> one of the, in, the, in that last picture, the, um, uh, in the center with the red vest is a, is a Maliseet, um graduate student of mine named Suzanne Greenlaw, who's doing work in Acadia National Park that, that really builds on some of the work that you guys have done in, in parks and working with parks. But, you know, she's been able to design you know, in terms of these um, access, uh, um, um, you know, um, protocols that, the, that are in parks in terms of our gathering, yeah, you know, she's really able to flip it on its head, showing the ways in which uh, even the research design on a lot of these projects, as you know, Clint, are are like completely, you know, quote unquote scientific, and yet um, totally devoid, you know, totally don't look. Uh, or appreciate what it is that indigenous um, gathering and management is about, stewardship is about. Um, to your to your larger question, you know this the project that kind of brought me to this one was about our um, is um, related to climate change adaptation, and so we've been uh, taken actually some leadership in just the last couple of months with uh, NE Cask uh, and and doing some work in in our region around that. Um, but I would say at its core and, and um, is really is, is about food sovereignty. You know, I think, um, you know, that was so powerfully uh, given by the video you shared, you know, the, the idea that, you know, um, us, us relying on ourselves and our, in our lands uh, and, and, and bringing that work together um, mm -hmm. is really, um, I think, 
you know, why, re, you know, in some ways, rematriation, um, uh, examples of rematriation can look like, you know, a food sovereignty community, you know, often, I mean, it's, it's, it can, it, and it can look like any, a lot of other things culturally, right? It can look like, um, um, you know, broader stewardship and, and, and activities related to uh, teaching yeah. and learning. You know, I think it, it's all those things, right? So right. I guess for, you know, I think for, for me, it is, uh, you know, if I were to, you know, categorize it under, you know, is it food? I think the climate and the, the, the access points um, do recenter like what the purpose is. And I think it is that um, it, it is about relationships um, rooted in our own food sovereignty um, and ability to maintain ourselves in, in our in our homeland. I guess my, you know, I think going back at you in terms of, I mean, I think the enclosures is what I was trying to say. Like we even the easements themselves are so so screwed. I mean, they're so tied to like, you know, yeah. wilderness and like no people. I mean, of course, you know, these these protected enclosures are like, you know, the first thing they did, of course, was pick kick us as indigenous people out of the, these places yeah. so i think it's like you know this this you know it's very you have to be so self-conscious and opportunistic you know at times and i guess you know kind of back back at you like in terms of you know the possibilities of this work in terms of what you guys uh, what you all are doing um down there in in in, in cherokee like you know what what are the best possibilities you know and i mean i think these openings i mean i'm a i'm a realist like yeah i was like okay let's move we're getting we got 1500 acres back i mean that's that's you know that's a thing like you know it, yeah. it's it's like tangible like and like you know we can touch it you know we can we can um feel it you know uh so all that i mean asked you know for for you all i know that in terms of parks and other things, you guys have been doing this um, a lot longer than we have. So I just, you know, in terms of that engagement and, and ability to kind of uh, regain or, or, you know, what are the, you know, what are the, you know, best <laughs> possibilities of that? Or how do you think mm -hmm. about that strategically, I guess? Yeah, and I mean, what, what my mind goes to is how, you know, from that perspective and, I think this is illuminated in in the work that you shared, and then the way that we think about our work, even if even if not explicitly stated by the medicine keepers, but how land back is is expansive and multifaceted. Um, in addition to what you said uh, about the kind of definitional, like okay, this like you know, um, what's the the phrase? I think this is Leanne Simpson, um, who I'll paraphrase here, but like the opposite of dispossession isn't possession, you know? Right. So kind of recentering relationships as opposed to like a repossession or, um, you know, something entrenched in the property system and, and kind of patriarchal or heteropatriarchal ways of seeing the world and commodifying nature. Um, and so, you know, I look at these, you know, you mentioned these strategies is kind of being realist and, and absolutely to me, it's like, okay, yeah, land back. Absolutely. Uh, but it, it's what I love about the movement is that it's, it's, it's in your face, kind of a ultimatum, like all of it back, right? Like you said, all of these things, it's not just land. It's not just ownership or property. It's everything that was lost and, and that was stolen. And in, in the process of doing that, we see these, projects that you know I really wanted to plug Beth Rose's book because she has a, 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 a sentence in there a, a, a section where she's like you know the ideal is all of this back right like that's she's not saying that this is the the pinnacle like land native land trusts and co cultural conservation easements are the pinnacle I mean she leaves that open to say like all of it back and in indigenous hands or, or under indigenous kind of care, frameworks of care, uh, whatever you want to call that management, stewardship, etc. cetera. Um, but these are mechanisms through which we're seeing that happen and a lot, um, a lot quicker, right? <laughs> like yeah. relatively speaking. Um, so, so that to me, it speaks volumes about, okay, how do we, again, think of this as strategic engagement, think of it as uh, ways of getting um, what, we need access to what we you know so so land back in 
and in and, and many different shades or there's a spectrum of that project that keeps that ultimate goal in mind. That's that's the the um, the, the compass or the, the, the North Star, if you will, um, but also continues to work incrementally, strategically, relationally, like even the project, the Buffalo National River project was, I mean, it was like four, you know, honestly, from inception to two weeks ago, it was eight years. And so, yeah, of course, some of that, a lot of it was bureaucracy, both tribal and national park service, right? Um, but an equal amount was relationships. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's a part of the equation is that, and this is where it gets, you know, nuanced and it gets, um, you know, a little messy, but in a good way is that, you know, some, some might say you take like kind of a radical approach, like why are you engaging with the US government at all, right? Uh, and there have been criticisms about the gathering rule that was um, established in the Federal Register in 2016 you know, about like, why do we need to do this, that, and the other to do something that we're just, we just have a right to plain and simple. And, you know, I get those critiques and I totally understand that, you know, it can rub people the wrong way when, for example, you have to talk about your plant knowledge in order to establish the agreement and then yeah. enact the, the gathering. But the way that we, we did it, and so I've got a forthcoming publication about the process, uh, was, you know, each step of the way was consultation and was, um, you know, I, I acted as kind of a liaison between the research team, the National Park Service and the medicine keepers, and was like, okay, we're going to talk about the ethnobotanical study. How much are we going to talk about these plants? And in that consultation pro process, it was bare minimum. We're going to establish some baseline information that, you know, if people get a hold of the information, they're not going to say, oh, yeah. basically it addresses the history of exploitation and of, uh, you know, on the flip side, ridicule of indigenous knowledge that Cherokee people and many other indigenous people aren't willing to share those intimate and, and intricate details of, for example, medicinal knowledge. And so to address that in a way that was like, okay, well, what what, can, what do we feel comfortable with sharing in order to get to achieve this goal right here? And that was a process of relational work. Um, and, and it was, you know, so process and relationality were key. And so these type of things is, is kind of where I tend to reside um, as opposed to the kind of more oppositional framework, which again, it's not that I'm, um, you know, disparaging folks who are just, you know, wanting to, uh, go for it all. But, you know, the reality that that's not going to happen tomorrow. Um, what can we do to, to kind of keep moving forward in the, in the, you know, in the meantime? So anyway, that's kind of my, um, yeah, it's, so, about your... it's been so funny. Like, let me just share some of this emotional thing that I've experienced in the last year, um, where, you know, intellectually, what drew me to the work, the idea that, you know, as you know, Clint, I have a law degree. So I'm like, oh, we can write these, you know, um, cultural use agreements, with, which uh, they have a lot of them in California. Um, part of it is the way that the, the, the conservation easements work out there. Um, and, and then then you realize, oh, there are sort of these, this regular, like the, 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 the situation I talked about where it's like, oh, we need to measure, I mean, it's even worse than the, 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 you know, having to do an environmental assessment and then a finding of no significant impact, right, which is the federal government side of it. They're like, no, we need to monitor all the human activity on our conserved land. And they're like, well, that's not, that's not going to happen. So I was like, screw it. We're just, just forget about any of those agreements. We're just going to buy the land back. So one way or the other, you know, it's like it was those, that emotion to realize like, my God, the colonial sort of like the idea that we would do it in partnership with their tools are just so like driven by these very like, you know, th they're created against us. <laughs> you know, it feels like really personal. Like these tools are uh, against indigenous use, right? They're, they're purposely meant to like insult us you know that's what the I mean I, I it's probably not true but I'm just saying like that sort of emotional sort of landscape I mean I've come back from that emotion around it but I think I just wanted to share that because I think you know that's as you do this work 
and when people talk about these system, the property systems, I mean, I can, you know, do the anthro speak around it, but I mean, you know, the, those regimes and how they function on the ground, right? That's what we are trying to understand here is they function as, as, as a colonial insult. So much yet, and yet here we are, we have people who want to do the right thing with us in partnership with us. And they're like, maybe we can find it. Maybe we can change some legislation. Maybe we can, you know, I mean, maybe there's, there's ways into it. And because, you know, our elders are always like, well, the land will come back to, you know, that this is this, this view, which is, <laughs> it'll, it, it'll come back, you know, kind of in a way like that, that faith and that, um, the, that we're here to stay. They're just sort of visitors, you know, kind of. <laughs> yeah. yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, if I could ask you, um, just like to, uh, for everyone and in the audience that if they have any questions, I just remind you that you can raise your hand and or, or put, a, um, put it into the chat and I can read it out loud. But meanwhile, I also wanted to ask you, um, Darren and, and Clint, um, if like uh, talking about this, this, this thing about moving forward that you were, were saying, Clint, uh, how to move forward. And, and I wanted to, to ask you whether, whether there's something about um, the interaction of, of, of knowledges and practices that you were, both of your, 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 um, your works uh, speak to. And, and it made me think about um, in which ways do you see this also as an opportunity in, in, in terms of, I mean, clearly Clint, when you talk about this term um, that has to do with the acceptation, uh, like a way of co-opting conservation or like the way in which mainstream conservation is conceived, but there's more than that. There's like an excess of, of that, that indigenous peoples or a framework, a conservation framework for indigenous perspective is also um, taking on board um, in terms of um, conceiving conservation also uh, as an alternative to the ways in which well-being itself is conceived and, and including, for instance, recentering health in, in conservation initiatives and whether, whether in that sense, uh, your, that concept that you're putting forth and, and, and the relationality aspect that you both talk about, whether with the land, but can we also talk about relationality in terms of knowledges that are, you know, um, mm -hmm sort of being um, entering in dialogue in, 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 in the processes that, that you both describe as like the, uh, the rematriation, the land back movements, but also the, the small scale initiatives that you both engage with. Is there something about the, the, um, the, the different knowledges and practices that are enacted or interact in the forms of conservation uh, framed by the Wabanaki, by the Cherokee and other peoples? Um, that sort of show uh, uh, an, an opportunity, some sort of hope, or, or, or um, th that you can that you can see the um, as a way of moving forward. Yeah, <clears throat> well, absolutely. Like, I think I've been thinking about this, so it's interesting that you mentioned you know future and and hope um, because I've been working on a, a piece uh, with my my current graduate student on indigenous optimism in the colonial scene is what we're calling it. And this gets back to kind of what, uh, what Darren, you were talking about as far as a critical take on what has become commonplace um, in terms of the, you know, the use of this term, the Anthropocene. Um, and you, you illuminated this in your talk, Darren, but that, you know, it's, it's less about, and I thought that you're um, bringing up the kind of original source of that statistic or whatever that that those numbers from the world bank report was really helpful because as you said you know i'm seeing it everywhere and that's kind of like the rallying cry mm -hmm. um but to from your take on it your perspective of like oh hold up hold up look like in a sense it, it's still kind of that even that 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 passage from the report it's still erasing indigenous it's, it's erasing colonialism and it's erasing um what has led to the current moment of, of dispossession and, you know, it's taking for granted that there is this kind of image of, of these uh, pure 
indigenous people with their pure lands and, you know, and, and, and defending them when it doesn't reveal, uh, you know, the, the centuries of um, extraction, exploitation that, you know, are hand in hand with colonialism and, 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 and capitalism and imperialism, you know, it, 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 it's kind of a, um, a, a blanket statement that is very, very close to talking about the Anthropocene without a critical um, understanding of, of which human, you know, and <laughs> um, who, who, who are the anthro in the Anthropocene? And, you know, granted, like, I, I, I'll be the first to say that even in our indigenous nations, and, and Cherokee Nation is certainly um, an example, um, you know, we have a, a, a variety of perspectives on um, what it means to interact with the land that aren't always in alignment with our traditional or whatever you want to call them, our, um, you know, ancestral teachings. Uh, and so that's an issue that, um, and I'll come full circle to your question, um, Tammy, I, I think I'm getting off on a little bit of a tangent here, but it comes uh, back to the issue of like the significance of, the, of a group like the Medicine Keepers and in influencing policy decisions. And one thing that I wanted to mention going back to the photo voice project was, you know, that method for those who don't know about it uh, was it originated in uh, community health, uh, community based health. Uh, promotion work and, um, you know, in, in the 80s and was intended to uh, directly influence policy. And so we use that as a tool, that method and the, this kind of the package that we, we ultimately ended up with was the video. And I actually have the link that I can post in the chat. You can watch it on YouTube if you want. But that directly influenced our tribal counselors, our elected officials to, uh, in turn, however many years later, look, where are we at? Seven years later, established the Medicine Keepers Preserve. So that's not a given, even within our own tribal communities, that we're going to conserve land. Um, there's a, a long history of kind of just going along with former Bureau of Indian Affairs land management practices, including cattle ranching, which entails, you know, clear cutting uh, oak and hickory forests that are home to these medicinal plants that we value as Cherokees for, for our cultural uses. And so anyway, there's, there's that element. And I think that is, is important to state because you know, we're having these conversations within our own communities as much as we are with um, you know, entities like um, uh, the U US government or whichever agency you wanna pick. Um, I guess getting back to your question about um, you know, futures and hope, um, you know, we view, I mean, this, the medicine keepers work, and I didn't have a chance to talk about this, but um, we're, we're working in tandem with our conservation projects. We're working with um, Cherokee young people to um, actively perpetuate this knowledge and these practices. And that in itself is it's a land education program. Uh, and we, we call it the, the Cherokee Environmental Leadership Program um, is a related component that the, the um, a part of the NSF grant that I mentioned earlier, uh, but that is a way that in itself is an, is an act of futurity, um, as well as the Buffalo National River project, because, you know, we think about going back to climate change, um, we look at where we ended up. And of course, that wasn't inevitable. It was, it was due to colonial dispossession. But the Cherokee Nation straddles two eco-regions, one of which to the west has less and less of the plants that we know and identify as Cherokee, quote, Cherokee plants. Um, to the east, we've been able to maintain a relationship to a lot, not all. And in fact, we, we lost access to a third, I think it might be more than that, two thirds of our uh, plants that we know and use in the homelands after removal. But we've maintained relationships, this is getting back to that relational continuity piece, um, to the plants that grow in what is now what is known as the, um, the Ozark Highlands. And that's where the Buffalo National River, that national park, is located smack in the middle of uh, northern, what is now known as northern Arkansas. So I'll, I'll end with this concept, but we're thinking about it as an eco-cultural insurance policy in a, that may be a you know, it's kind of a playful term, but at the same time, thinking about futurity, thinking about hope and optimism in the colonial scene, we're, we're looking toward ways and uh, uh, way, 
mechanisms by which we can ensure that Cherokee people in the future have access to plants um, that we see are actively changing within our current territory. And that's amid, again, this, this kind of landscape of checkerboarded or these islands of tribal trust lands that uh, we have limited you know, a, you know, access to and control over when it comes to conservation. So I'll end my remarks there and see if, if Darren has anything else to add. Some fascinating examples. Yeah, Darren, can we get um, a take on this topic? Yeah, I, I mean, what, what the only thing I would add, and, and actually I think Clint is better at uh, this formulation than I am um, around the knowledge systems that create, you know, I think, you know, and we, you know, we 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 use um, the two-eyed seeing framework. It's a Wabanaki framework from Elder uh, Albert Marshall, and um, mm -hmm. and it's for in it in it in one of the key elements of it, and sort of it's very sort of Wabanaki. But I think most other indigenous knowledge systems related to place and and stewardship have this right, which is in, in a sort of an epistemology that. Um, you know, the knowing of something creates a responsibility um, mm. to it. So, you know, it's really hard to, you know, and I think that's the, 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 you know, that's what makes indigenous science or knowledge systems, you know, different than Western science uh, uh, traditions where, where the, you know, objectification can, you know, ha has no um, particular obligation tied to the knowing. Um, but I, I, you know, I think, you know, as, that knowledge, I think that's why the stewardship, you know, it's like Wabanaki, um, you know, we think about it as the place, but you know, the whole other side of this, and we mobilize this in our climate change work too, is, is um, rooted in the knowledge systems is, is our formulations of diplomacy as it relates to place. Because diplomacy is not, is, is place, but it's also process, right? So, you know, as we enact our stewardship it, it also enacts management, it enacts knowledge, just it, it enacts all of it, um, which is rooted in those core obligations. You know, our original treaties are, are not with England or they're with uh, non-humans, right? <laughs> than with our other tribal nations. So I think, you know, those formulations just begin from a different place. Um, and, and so I'd say that's also one of the, one of the pieces that makes the, you know, the enclosure functions with the knowledge, right, as well, the knowledge system, right, that's why Suzanne Greenlaw uh, <laughs> tried to, you know, she has to, um, you know, during the environmental assessment phase for the, the gathering, you know, in, in Acadia National Park, it's like, you know, there's a kind of an, literally an enclosure there around uh, the knowledge that gets, that can be, you know, considered legitimate, right? And, and, and sort of creating proof that we're not gonna harm, you know, the thing that we have this high obligation to, right? And so these are the, you know, then it gets, again, back to that sort of odd trauma, like colonial, you know, and I think that's, if anything, that makes people more militant, <laughs> Clint. I think it's like, oh, oh, we have to prove the that we won't harm the thing that you guys have been harming for the last couple hundred years and in order for us who had it like it was here for you when you, when you got here you crazy colonists now now we have to prove that what you know it's this whole thing and and i think you know the colonial disorder is that yeah we also um use these regimes of mismanagement too for economic and other interests but you know sort of how do we enact you know how to how you know it's like it cuts both ways like i i like to play it out you know differently when we like you know uh you know i may <laughs> i wrote a really hard, hard critique of shepherd Crack's book the ecological indian it's like you know they'll be like well you over hunted an animal back in whatever period and as like why or, or I, i'll say in in this work uh, one of the con land trusts said oh um i know forested lands have been transferred to indigenous people and then they really cut a lot and i'll be like oh okay well we're gonna just let's compare indigenous forestry management with uh with um you know white <laughs> you know forestry like it's like it's it it's these are the sort of denials that are sort of in this like you know um you know uh, moves to innocence or whatever it is that people who 
don't support this work are able to play out in both directions. I mean, that's why I try to play out the argument in both directions around the knowledge I'm, as well. Yeah, I'm, I'm conscious of time now, but um, we have just a few minutes, and I just wanted to 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 point at that um, um raise that point that you just mentioned, Darren, with regards to to how you're constantly asked to proof or like evidence in order to to support the, the your arguments and. And since you're both um, indigenous scholars, I'm wondering how, what's your take in terms of evidence related um, to indigenous centered conservation and, and to the, the extent to which it, it, it has contributed to advance the conservation debate, both in academia and praxis. What do you think about that? And, and, and very briefly, I guess, because we're just like wrapping up with this question. Well, I'll say, so I resonate really, I really resonate with what you just said, Darren, as far as, um, you know, thinking about, um, yeah, the complexities of having to engage uh, with, with colonial practices, but also putting that uh, in kind of relative uh, juxtaposition to, you know, as you mentioned, you know, the, this, the large scale kind of industrial activity of, of settler society. Um, um, yeah, it, it, it pales in comparison. Um, and it's also structurally limited in terms of the, the choices that tribes may have uh, for just uh, supporting their people, right? And so we think about um, engagements with various um, types of industry. But at the same time, we look to, um, you know, getting back to uh, the question, Temi, that you raised, um, you know, we look to places like Menominee or, or you know, other kind of instances where um, that relationship to place and to, uh, you know, sustainability, indigenous sustainability, if you will, um, it, it, it is in, in, enacted very differently when um, you have that sense of sovereignty um, and, and, and kind of oversight, if you will, for lack of a better term. Um, and so when we get to kind of like those questions about, you know, indigenous conservation and um, you know, how it kind of intervenes into the, in, in, the, in the discussion where my mind goes is, and this is again, picking up on a point you made, Darren, um, we can't take for granted that the national parks in, in the United States are this benign thing. I mean, obviously, I think people are more and more aware of the historical, um, the, what has led to the, their formation historically, and that has entailed um, indigenous dispossession. Um, and so Mark Spence's book is, is, you know, one of those and many others who critique the National Park Service. And yet we still have these books, um, you know, by like Ken Burns, America's greatest idea or best idea was the national parks. But kind of to add on to that layer, um, the, the taking for granted the fact that national parks, even despite that history, are today good things. Yeah, it, it's it's drastically different than from what likely and from what often surrounds the, the borders of national parks. But then when we think about the implications of this colonial enclosure, this conservation enclosure, as having excluded human beings, native people from those lands, that's also a, um, an implication for the health of those lands. You know, so so that's where I'm kind of trying to, to push back against like, OK, the Buffalo National River, as a case in point, is surrounded by agriculture, cattle ranching, um, you know, things that we would generally think are detrimental to the environment. Right. But the park itself is not um, immune from critique when it comes to, you know, um, decades of, of of exclusion of people as key components of that place, as key ecological components, if you will, of that place. And so how do, how does that kind of push back against the fact that, you know, um, leaving nature alone uh, is a quote, good idea. Um, and so hopefully, you know, in line with what you're saying about diplomacy as kind of being a container for stewardship or caretaking and, and, and knowledge that is in relation to the land, um, that's what we hope as well influences uh, or is a part of this agreement is that Cherokee people, in fact, it's in the agreement, uh, but we hope that that plays out in ways that actually improves this place um, as Cherokee people would through their knowledge. Anyway, that's a little bit longer of an answer than you expected, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> these, nine, these 19 people are still here with us. I, I will say that um, much like you know, in, in a longer version of talk, I go through all these papers that are actually kind of like in, 
environmental science and policy or in biological conservation and ecology and society um, that are basically saying, you know, uh, in conservation, um, you know, requ the best conservation has indigenous leadership. It has indigenous people that, at, and, and, and if you think about globally climate justice movements are, you know, uh, indigenous people are, are, are in similar roles. And, and so I think, you know, that evidence of those studies, you know, where they measure the effectiveness of, you know, the relative effectiveness, I think it, I think it's really helpful. So, I mean, I think, and, and they're mostly in, you know, they're, they're using very, <laughs> this isn't an indigenous science, this is, they're using, you know, the same tools of measurement of conservation success that they've always used. They just are like, oh, let's look at it within, with and without indigenous people. I mean, the, the deeper dive is actually like, you know, the rubrics of, of, um, of measurement that might come from indigenous perspectives. You know, I think indigenous knowledge systems that um, a couple of the papers are starting to do that, but I, it's, it's, you know, this proof in the pudding kind of thing is effective to a point. I mean, the world is, as we all know, is not, you know, willing to reorient our, the extractive colonial uh, capitalisms, right? Just because, you know, some indigenous people um, say the future of, of our human life on the planet is, is dependent upon it. Um, uh, but I think, you know, in terms of influencing, you know, environmentalists or in, in, in conservation groups, you know, I think there's been this real growth in it. So I think there's a massive awareness of it. Putting it into practice is still in its nascent stages, but it is a few years down that road. So I would just say like, um, you know, I think, and I think Beth Rose just got a big grant <laughs> to, to even think more yeah. deeply about this work. Yeah. And I'm looking forward to that. And um, right. You know, just because she's so good at combining all these things in her scholarship, so I'd just say, um, yeah, I'm really, I'm really inspired by the the scholarship and and it, its uh, efficacy for the work that we're trying to support here. Um, but it it's it, it's at its limits, right? And I think it's then where are those limits are are where we can really push. And I think um, that's what I want, you know. Uh, scholars to 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 do right. I, I want the scholars to kind of push that with us, and I think there's great evidence that that that's happening. Um, so I think, um, yeah, that's where I'm at. <laughs> well, um, we've come to the end of our session, unfortunately. Um, thanks for such such fruitful debate, and um, thank you both for being here and everyone else as well. Special thanks um, for our, uh, to our organizers who, on behalf of the Indigenous Studies Discussion Group, the Heritage and Colonialism Discussion Group, and the Center for Research in the Arts and the Sciences, um, and the Social Sciences and Humanities at the University of Cambridge, have been able to make this event possible. Um, and well, I would like to invite you all to check their website and follow up on them on social media as well, just to remain attentive to a great agenda that they have put together for the next couple of months as well. So thanks again, Clint and Darren, for your time. That was a precious debate. Thank you so much. I, I thought Thank we were you. in agreement. <laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> Thank you all so much. And, and just on behalf of the Indigenous Studies Discussion Group and the Heritage and Colonialism Discussion Group as well, uh, we want to thank Tammy for, for her great moderation of this event. Um, and just to, to reiterate what she said as well, Clint and Darren, your presentations were so educational for all of us and your, your discussion and conversation was so engaging. So thanks so much again for, for taking the time today to, to be with us and, and to speak with us about your presentations. Thanks so much. Absolutely. Yeah. Great to meet you all, and Darren, great to see you again. Yeah, likewise. See you guys. Bye. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye.